Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Jody Guest. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist and professor and senior vice chair of the Department of Epidemiology at Rollins School of Public Health here at Emory University. I have led Emory's COVID-19 outbreak response team for the past three years and am the host for Emory's COVID-19 videos where we have covered the numbers and the changing information and guidelines since the onset of the pandemic. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Carlos Del Rio as we discuss where we are with COVID-19 now in August of 2023. Dr. Del Rio is a distinguished professor of medicine, epidemiology, and global health at Emory, and is the interim dean of Emory University School of Medicine and the interim chief academic officer at Emory Healthcare. Welcome, Dr. Del Rio, and thank you for joining me again today. Delighted to be with you. While we no longer track COVID-19 numbers the way we have for the first three years of the pandemic, we do know that COVID-19 hospitalizations are up more than 20% in the past two weeks and the highest they have been in the year 2023. Additionally, death rates are up by 8%. Nationally, both hospitalizations and deaths associated with COVID-19 are actually much lower than they have been through the majority of the pandemic, though they are rising quickly, particularly in the Southeast. Georgia's daily COVID hospitalization admissions are up 51% in the past two weeks. And we see similar increases in Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Tennessee. We are watching three new COVID-19 variants closely, two of which, EG.5 and FL.1.5.1, are now the most common variants in the United States. We're also watching a new variant, BA.2.86, with just a few cases in the United States, but a variant that has a very large number of mutations. And we're gonna talk specifically about that variant in a moment. So Dr. Del Rio, let's start with the most commonly circulating variants. Most data seems to show that they are not associated with more severe disease. And we really don't think these two variants are more transmissible than our previously circulating variants. Do you feel comfortable that they are not the reason we are seeing the current uptick in hospitalizations and deaths across the United States? Well, I think, I think uh, Jody, first of all, thank you for, for having me. And it's always you know, a pleasure to talk to you. I think one thing that, that we need to keep in mind is that the environment changes, behavior changes, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the virus changes, right? So uh, people are... are not using masks, they are gathering, the people are, are pretty much resumed back to normal life. So there's more contact of, of individuals. And if there's a transmission of the virus and the virus is changing and there's virus evolution, you are gonna see a more transmission. I think what, what's happening though, is that as, as this happens, so human behavior changes, the virus changes, the, the, the way in which our immune system, we, uh, you know, we have sort of a, what I call a, a immunological uh, wall. So we have more people vaccinated. We have more people who've been infected. The combination of those gives you a significant protection, particularly against severe disease, against hospitalization and death. But we also know that that immunity wanes and it wanes in particular for people over the age of, of 65. And the older you get, the more likely that, immu that immunity is gonna wane. And why why is that uh, why is that important? Well, because the uh, the unfortunately the the vaccination coverage that we have in the U.S. is not is not ideal. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at who has received the last uh, who has been boosted with the last booster, it's only about sixteen percent of the U.S. population, and it's only about forty six percent of those people over the age of of sixty five. And if you go to who has been boosted in the uh, in the last uh, with the you know people over the age sixty five were told to receive yet another booster uh, some some months ago? The number is even lower. So the reality is the hospitalizations that you're seeing, the people that you're seeing hospitalized, you know, when you look at the updated bivalent booster, that you're probably down to to you know maybe fifteen percent of the adult population. So what you're seeing is we're losing a little bit of that immunological barrier because of way no immunity. So that is the, the, that should be the target. The target should be how do we get people over the age of 65 vaccinated? Because those are the people we're seeing hospitalized. Those are the people that we're seeing uh, hospitalized uh, as a result of COVID infection. You're absolutely right. You know, the numbers in the, the way we're tracking the data with hospitalizations really uses 70 and older as one of the larger 
um, groups. And that is where we see the vast majority of increase and the strikingly fast increase in hospitalizations. So that is definitely a group we need to be talking about. And, um, and, again, and again, I want to emphasize to people that, you know, when we think about hospitalizations and when we think about the number of people hospitalized, the numbers are still, you know, very, very uh, small compared to what they were at the peak of the pandemic, right? I mean, we are seeing approximately about 12,000 people hospitalized with COVID-19 in, in a week. That's about, you know, a rate of about 3.8 per 100,000. That is really still nowhere close to what it was during the, the height of the pandemic. But the reality is that we are seeing an increase, as you mentioned, that's about a 20 one 22 percent increase over over the last uh, you know in, in past several weeks so we're seeing a rapid increase so again it, it emphasizes and we're going to get to vaccines why we need to get those uh the new the new vaccine uh, out there but again we need to get the vaccine and we need to get people vaccinated and those two are two different things Right, absolutely. And we are going to talk about the timing with the new vaccine coming out in just a moment. Real fast before we move away from these two circulating variants, have you seen any changes in the symptoms associated with these two new strains that are circulating? You know, there's a lot of people that have talked about conjunctivitis. Uh, I have seen uh, more people present again with, with, with anosmia, with loss of sense of smell that we weren't seeing before. But in general, it's still like a bad flu. And when I, you know, when you see people with COVID, they tell you it was like if I had a bad flu. Uh, the throat, sore throat is pretty significant and the fatigue is pretty significant. So, you know, if you feel like you have a, a respiratory infection and you have a very bad sore throat, then COVID and get tested. Very good, thank you. So let's talk about this new variant um, as well. So last week, the WHO added BA.2.86 to its list of variants under monitoring, given its very large number of mutations. And they put it under monitoring because of the mutations, not because there are a large number of cases of it detected so far, but it's also been detected across almost all the regions of the, of the world. The number of genetic mutations is described as roughly the same magnitude seen in the jump in variants between Delta to the original Omicron variant. And we know that we saw a very large uptick in cases when that happened. So yesterday, the CDC issued its initial risk assessment of the BA.2.86 variant, which says tests and treatments will likely be effective and that updated vaccines will still be able to reduce severe disease and hospitalizations. This risk assessment was put out on the heels of detections in three more countries. So this variant has now been seen in multiple countries, including as of yesterday, South Africa, Switzerland, and Thailand. And the US has two reported detections of this variant over just the past few days. One is a person in Michigan, and one is a person with a traveler uh, history from Japan. So based on what the CDC knows now, COVID-19 tests and medications used to treat COVID-19 appear effective against this variant, but this is a very interesting statement that they put in their um, review. One concern is whether the new virus can escape existing immunity, which we were just talking about, from earlier infection and vaccination. So here's the quote. BA.2.86 may be more capable of causing infection in people who have previously had COVID-19 or who have received COVID-19 vaccines. So can you walk us through, Dr. Del Rio, that statement and the data behind it? Well, you know, what, what we know about, first of all, let me just start by saying that I really commend uh, uh, CDC for, for, for putting out this so-called uh, risk assessment. Yes. We've never had anything like this, and this is exactly what people in public health and what we as clinicians need. We need CDC to tell us, this is what's going on, this is what we know, and this is what we don't know. And I think it would have been nice to have something that said, and this is what we're doing to find out what we don't know. Because those three things really together tell you tell you a lot of, of, what's, of what you need to know. There is, uh, you know, the, the, the virus is, is continuously evolving. And I think one thing that has been uh, to me and to others surprising is, is how amazingly rapidly this virus is changes and evolves. And we think it evolves in the setting of immunological pressure, right? So many of us thought that Omicron would be the last of the, of the, of the strains, but Omicron has, has evolved over time. And, uh, and, but we're still having Omicron uh, uh, sort of variants. 
what what is different about this BA2.2.86 uh, uh, variant is that it really is a a emerge uh, from from a BA2 variant, so not from uh, uh, from an uh, from a very different uh, lineage, and it has thirty uh, amino acid differences and uh, and more than thirty five amino acid changes compared to what was circulating, which is the XBB.1.5, which is really what has been dominated 2013. So this is uh, uh, this makes it uh, this makes the difference uh, uh, about equivalent to what it was, what how different the Omicron variant, the initial Omicron variant compared was to the Delta variant. That's how different they are. And as you remember, we saw this massive increase in cases with Omicron after we had had Delta. So that's that's what people are very concerned about is that if this variant is that different, uh, what's going to happen? Are we not going to have enough immunity to prevent people from getting infected? So those are the those are the major concerns. I think the the on the positive side is that no uh, the the tests work. So the antigen uh, and the molecular test uh, uh, pick up this variant, and and the therapeutics we have. Whether you're talking about Paxlovid, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, Remdesivir, whether you're talking about Malnupiravir, uh, they're all effective against this variant. So uh, the good news is, is treatment works, uh, uh, testing works, but there's concern about how much immunity we're going to have from the vaccine. And and there is data also now. There was an, an interesting article published ahead of print showing that that two two doses of uh, of the bivalent uh, BA.5 simply uh, don't cut it to produce enough immunity against this. But but it does look like the monovalent XBB 1.5 booster that is going to come uh, hopefully in a couple of weeks, uh, mid-September uh, or so, uh, does appear to have some level of, of, of immunity and, and should hopefully have a significant, uh, uh, continue to have significant protection against hospitalization, severe disease, and death. And people that receive this booster. So again, emphasizing why this new booster is important. But but to me, the 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 problem is that we are we keep on chasing variants and we keep on trying to adjust our vaccines to the variants. And the problem is the variants are moving faster than our vaccines. So that's why it's very exciting uh, this new funding that was received for the next generation vaccines because we need a different kind of vaccines. We cannot continue chasing variants. We really need a more of a pan coronavirus vaccine something more broad that doesn't require us to be continuously adjusting our vaccines to the strains that are circulating now. And by the time we get the vaccine, they are likely to be different. Yeah, absolutely. Let, that is a perfect segue for us to move to this new vaccine that's going to be coming out. And again, it is a targeted vaccine. So it's not this, you know, this more broad vaccine that we're hoping for, but it is chasing a variant that is still circulating. So let's talk for a moment about that. The new COVID-19 vaccines are going to come out from Moderna, Pfizer, and Novavax, and they are all expected to come out sometime in mid to late September. It could be October before we see them widely available because we will be waiting for the FDA and the CDC to, to do the final review of the data and to approve them and put out the recommendation first. This new booster is targeted solely at a newer version of the virus that you've been alluding to, Dr. Del Rio, XBB.1.5. And that's the Omicron subvariant that we've had completely dominating all the summer cases and probably the variant that is mostly responsible for the increase in hospitalizations we've been seeing in the past few weeks. So data has shown um, that these vaccines are well suited to our current circulating variants and that and because they are also Omicron subvariants. So based on the timing of this booster coming out, it feels to me like it's actually pretty good alignment with the variants we are seeing now. And I want to make sure you agree with the statement that the recommendation is to not get the bivalent booster that's currently available if you're due for, you know, if you could get an updated booster, but instead wait for this new one to come out. Do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that is the, uh, that is exactly the message. The message is right now, you know, the, those, those bivalent boosters really play no role unless you've never been vaccinated. If yeah. you've never been vaccinated, that is receiving that vaccine is really your your sort of your your initial vaccination. Your your basic uh, vaccine uh, dose should be with that vaccine. But once you've been vaccinated, 
uh, in the past or, you know, or you have been infected or you've been vaccinated and infected, then, then wait until this new, uh, and new zoo vaccine appears. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the companies have already submitted their application to the FDA. The vaccine uh, uh, advisory committee is gonna be meeting soon to discuss it and to give us recommendation. And shortly thereafter, the, uh, uh, the CDC is going to come out and, uh, and, and give us recommendations about who should take it and when. My guesstimate is that around September 15th or so, we will be seeing uh, the data that we need and we will see the recommendations that will tell us who, who should get the vaccine. There is obviously the concern out there that these vaccines are not going to be free. You know, now the companies are going to going to sell them, and the estimate is about one hundred and ten dollars a shot. So, if you have health insurance, uh, your 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 uh, your insurance should cover it, uh, like they do for the you know other vaccines, uh, you know, flu and others. But if you don't have insurance, the government is is trying to make every effort so the those that that don't have insurance, the uninsured, and have access to the vaccine for free because we simply cannot not vaccinate uh, some of the most vulnerable populations. That would be a, a big mistake. Absolutely. That would be tragic to see that happen. And, um, you know, so far in the pandemic, all of our vaccinations have been free. And again, with, with insurance, if you have um, the option for insurance, recommended vaccines are still going to be covered. But um, we do really need to make sure we're watching what happens for those who don't have access to health insurance. Um, again, the timing of this is going to be right at the time we would normally be talking about getting your seasonal flu uh, shot. So do you feel comfortable getting both a seasonal flu shot as well as an updated COVID-19 vaccine at the same time this year? Uh, yes, and I would also say that because I'm over the age of 60, I probably feel comfortable getting uh, getting an RSV uh, uh vaccine and we we could talk about RSV vaccination, but I, I feel like that would be the other thing I would do. The reality is that that now we have uh, vaccines against those three respiratory viruses. And for people over the age of 60, which are at high risk of hospitalization and death, uh, because we that would be a, a good thing to do because the reality is uh, many of us are suspecting that we're going to see uh, what, what we've seen in the past, which is in Northern Hemisphere. We're going to see an early RSV wave followed by a flu wave and finishing off with a COVID vaccine wave. So we're going to see those three viruses circulating and full circulating in our community. And if you're over the age of 60, uh, you want to avoid them. You can actually get the RSV injection now. Like that one is actually already available for most Correct. people. Um, so if you are um, starting to hear of anyone having RSV, you can get that injection now if you're in the age groups that are eligible for it and then get the COVID-19 and flu vaccine together or you can get all three together, as Dr. Del Rio was saying. Um, let's talk about those uh, people who are between the ages of two, um, sorry, children who are up to the age of two. What do you think the recommendations are going to be for that age group with this new COVID-19 monovalent uh, vaccination that comes out? Well, I suspect it's gonna be a recommendation. Uh, there's gonna be a recommendation that, that they receive the vaccine I don't think that it's going to be a strong recommendation. I, I don't necessarily think it's going to be a a, a, a a mandate, or I don't think it's going to be something that is going to be incorporated into the into the vaccination uh, sk the schedule. But I, I suspect there's going to be um, some some recommendation that that everybody should be vaccinated and and with making it stronger for for young kids. Okay, and then six months to two year old children. A lot of them have not received any of the COVID-19 vaccines so far. Do you think that there will be a recommendation for them to receive more than one of these um, of this newer monovalent? No, I don't think so. I think I think again the recommendation is going to be, I mean, I think that's what we need to see how they decide whether they're going to say receive the bivalent followed by the monovalent or just go directly to the to the monovalent. I, I think you know. This is going to be a recommendation based on, 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 frankly, very little data, and that's part of the issue, right? So speaking of very little data, let's go back to the that this newest variant, BA.2.86 again. Um, the current CDC's assessment is that the updated vaccine, the monovalent that will be coming out sometime in September, October, will be effective at reducing severe disease and hospitalizations. 
Um, is it still too early to see whether or not this strain will cause more severe illness because of its worrying number of mutations? And are you comfortable that this vaccine will have enough coverage? Well, you know, again, I, I don't know how much coverage is going to have against infection. But again, infection has never been uh, the goal of this vaccine is preventing infection. You get a little bit of prevention of infection, but it, it wanes out, it goes away uh, fairly quickly. But the, uh, but I do hope that that they'll have continue to have a good protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. The uh, as far as is the strain more severe? Is it going to be uh, uh, more more severe? You know, it's it's a difficult question because as I said from the beginning, the uh, the, the, it, it's hard to assess severity when everything's changing, right? When when you have more immunity in the population, you have more experience. So it's not the difference. I mean, the most severe strain we confronted, it was the original Wuhan strain. Why? Because nobody had immunity. No, there was no immunity. When you have a naive population and you bring in a new virus like that, you're going to see what we saw is lots of hospitalizations, lots of severe disease, lots of death. Now we have more immune protection. So, so the whole scenario changes. So talking about, about how, how virulent the virus is, how severe the disease is going to be, it's, it's hard. And, and my assessment is, no, that it's not going to be more severe, that it's going to be uh, a, a, uh, a very similar. And I suspect what we're going to see is we may see more transmissibility just because of that immune escape. We may see uh, more people you know, being symptomatic because of that immune escape. But I, don't, I, don't, I suspect we're going to see hospitalization among those that have waning of immunity or those that have not been, uh, you know, immunized. So the lack of, of immune protection, whether it's, it's because you've never been vaccinated or you lost immunity or because you are immunosuppressed, those are the groups of individuals we're going to be worried about. So again, putting a, a mark on how important it's going to be to be watching for this new vaccine to come out and making sure that you um, find your way to one when it's available to you in your community. Um, some people are calling for the return of masks. Dr. Del Rio, do you suspect that we will see an, um, an increase in use of masks or even perhaps a mandate for masking? I, I don't think we're going to see that mandates for masking anymore. I, I don't think that's going to be the case. But I think, again, masking masking works, and especially if you use the right mask, right? So there's, there's, there's masking and there's masking. And as I tell people, you know, I saw patients throughout the COVID uh, pandemic in, in the hospital wearing masks. I never got infected. When I got infected, it was because I was at a social event not wearing a mask. So, if masks didn't work, I would have gotten infected in the hospital. So masks that are that are good masks, an N95, a, a high quality mask is going to work and is going to protect you. And and this is where I think people need to make their own risk assessment, right? Uh, if if you are over the age of 60, over the age of 70, and and you're worried, I mean, your immunity may be waning, and you may have some a health issues, some pulmonary issues, cardiovascular issues. You you have obesity. You're at high risk of severe disease. You may say, well, I'm going to wear a mask uh, when I'm in crowded events, or I may not go to a private event, or I may, you know, decide to take it, you know, to stay home uh, and, and, and go back to being a little more of a hermit uh, uh, when this surge is happening. I, I think when you're, when you're watching cases go up, you need to make that assessment. And I think, again, I tell people I think about masks like I think about umbrellas. You know, when it's raining, you get take out your umbrella and you use it. When it's not raining, you put it away. So when the numbers are down, you don't need to mask. When the numbers are up, uh, it's time to mask. So you really need to think about using masks uh, like you would use an umbrella. Very good. I like that analogy a lot. And we want to be, I want to go back to some of the original data that we presented at the beginning. You know, hospitalization rates are up a fair amount, although they are still low comparatively to other times in this pandemic. And death rates are very unfortunately up as well. Again, luckily not at the height that we've seen them or anywhere near that height, but the rising numbers of those two markers, plus what we know about wastewater surveillance really show us that there's a lot of COVID-19 out in the community. We don't track those numbers like we did before, but those are markers that are showing us that there's a lot of circulating COVID-19 out there. So there's, there's, there's another thing that people can, can track. 
number one, you track your friends, right? When I start hearing a lot of people around me saying, oh, I just got diagnosed with COVID. I just got diagnosed with COVID. And then the other way to track it is just try to go to a CVS or to a Walgreens right now and try to buy some COVID tests. They're not there. That means a lot of people are buying them. There's a lot of demand from them. So the reality is those are very good indicators that something is going on in the community. Um, yeah. But I remind people, you know, if you develop symptoms, uh, get tested. And if you test positive, if you are over the age of 65, especially if you're over the age of 70, you should get uh, therapy. There's effective therapies. I mentioned them before. There's, there's Paxlova, there's some Desivir, there's Malnipiravir. Uh, talk to your healthcare provider, get on therapy. And frequently what I see is somebody say, well, my doctor said I'm not sick enough to get treated. No, you get treated so you don't get sick enough. Uh, when you're that age, your highest, the highest risk of severe disease is age. And if you're over the age of 70, you don't wait until you're sick to start treatment. You get treatment because you don't want to get sick. So we, we, what frustrates me a lot is that we're seeing a lot of underuse of antivirals to treat COVID-19 in people that are eligible to receive them. And a lot of that uh, uh, underuse uh, comes from, unfortunately, my colleagues who don't necessarily know when to use them or who are afraid of using some of the drugs like Paxlovid because of the drug-drug interactions and other issues. So we do need a better management of the tools we have. We have tools, we're not just use, we're not using them the way we should. Very good, thank you for that. And let's, let's finish the conversation a bit on testing because again, with so much COVID-19 out in the community and as schools have started, I've heard a lot more about it from students and friends. Um, if you feel sick, we want you to test immediately. If that test is negative and you're symptomatic, we do recommend that you test again two to three days later to confirm that that was a true negative. And so make sure you're being very careful during that time period. One negative test, if you're symptomatic, you, you should not rely on just that. You should test again. If you've been exposed to people who have COVID-19 and you're experiencing symptoms, test immediately. If you've been exposed and have no symptoms, really the best timing for testing is six days after that exposure. And that exposure would be day zero that you wanna count. So, um, and in the meantime, again, personal risk assessment to consider using a mask as well if you know that you've had an exposure, especially if you're symptomatic. Well, Dr. I tell, I tell people uh, a couple of things. Number one, when you go by your COVID test, you realize that there are two tests in there. That's not because it's one for you and one for your partner, it's because there are two for the individual. In order for this test to really give you a better sensitivity, you need to test twice. So if the first one is negative, what you said, 24, 48 hours later, repeat it. And that's why there are two tests in the package. Number two, if you are symptomatic, even if you test negative, avoid going to events. Avoid, I mean, like, you know, we had a, a, a dinner with friends yesterday and somebody said, look, I, I, I'm not feeling well. I think I have the flu. I think I have a cold. I tested for COVID. I tested negative, but I'd rather not go. That's a that's very smart way. That's, that's a smart thing to do. That's protecting your community. And I think, again, I emphasize to people, we used to be very much into saying, telling people, uh, you know, uh, it's okay to come to work when you're sick. No, it's not okay to come to work when you're sick. Now we know this, uh, you, know, you know, working from home works. Stay, stay at home if you're sick. Don't come to work. That's what we need to do. Absolutely. And the same goes for school. Um, please keep your children home if they are sick or experiencing um, and exhibiting symptoms that look like COVID-19 as well until you've had those two tests to tell you that that is not what they have. But again, just be really careful about the people that you're going to be around and recognizing you're also, uh, you're, you're considering your own risk, but you're also considering the risk of those who are around you and that you get together with. Dr. Del Rio, thank you so much for meeting with me today and going over the latest updates on COVID-19. It's amazing to think about that we're still talking about this in um, August of 2023, but there's been quite a lot of new information in the past few weeks. So appreciate your time. And for everyone watching, thank you so much and please stay safe and look forward for more information about the newest monovalent vaccine coming out very soon. Thank you everyone, have a great day.